All right. Thanks, Anna, for the introduction. I got to admit, um, I don't have the full title on here. I don't have the full title on here. Um, it was really long, and these slides, uh, as Anna said, were like compiled in several night shifts, at least uh, the finishing touch. Um, and it's like really difficult to give this presentation now, especially since in the morning, um, they was already told, okay, in the keynote, um, is this the best we can do about security? And then the last slide of the uh, talk before me uh, was like, okay, an attacker will find uh, his way into your network anyways. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to talk now about uh, appliances that are supposed to uh, protect you from exactly that. Uh, but I will still try to do my very best. And at least you uh, may use this as input when you're discussing uh, with your executive level about certain aspects of your security architecture. Uh, all right, before I start the talk, uh, big thanks to a lot of persons. Without um, those persons, this presentation would not have been possible. I'm not going to name all of them, but uh, this is a second reference to the introduction in the morning, as Anna said. There's a great team at ENW, uh, like ENW friends on here, and without those, it would not have been possible. Um, all right, coming back to the presentation with the title Evaluating the APT Armor. I mean, you basically have a good idea what products we are referring to uh, when we are saying APT Armor. Um, however, I want to start the presentation with a different picture, uh, an x-ray of a foot, to be more precise, um, my broken foot. Um, I broke my foot roughly two years ago. Um, and since I'm quite an active guy and it's difficult for me to relax sometimes, which I also know about myself. So since I didn't have the chance to do very much and I like to exercise, I did some research back then. Okay, uh, is my exercising routine still like um, appropriate? Is there something that I could do to improve like exercising or anything? So I did some research on that. And of course you find a lot of great solutions in the internet. When you try to improve your workout results, you, you, can get, you can achieve results you don't even think are possible, uh, even in 12 weeks. <laughs> Um, and the nice thing is, you can even achieve the skin that. Color Come again? Even the skin color was changed. That's, uh, that's kind of the point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Um, I mean, um, it's all, yeah. So, and in those 12 weeks, I mean, there are also some shortcuts that you can take. For example, there are some ex extremely powerful exercises, like a squat, bicep, shoulder, press combination, which basically, I think, like one or two of those com native exercises and you are done, right? Now well, that's also really nice. And of course, since you have such extremely complex and effective exercises, um, you can reduce your workout time. So you only have to work out five minutes um, and you're done with your workout or achieve your perfect body in like 14 days uh, if you just follow those uh, great advice that we found on the other websites. Um, and then again, of course, um, everybody tells you, okay, um, when you're exercising, only 50% of your success is determined by the exercising and 50% by your diet. Uh, so people also read material about that. And luckily, everybody tells you, oh, there are cheat days in your diet. So you also can get around like this. So you have a lot of cheat days, but you're still like uh, having a good diet uh, that you're taking care of. So um, while all those like statements um, seem pretty funny to us, um, I wouldn't, of course, I mean, there are a lot of uh, bad uh, comparisons out there. However, um, this is not basic, basically not the point where I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to ask you some questions during the presentation. Um, so I'm not going to ask you whether uh, you ever did some stuff like that or how many cheat days you have. Um, however, I looked at some other stuff. If you look into the advertisement of uh, security appliances and stuff, there are appliances out there that are providing defenses before vulnerabilities are discovered. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're still laughing here, but how many of you are having a checkpoint IPS plate in their environment? On a That's, shelf uh, in the uh, basement unused. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I, I really would not believe that if nobody's raising the hand here, but um, maybe uh, you're not really sure. Or, I mean, I did not ask you about your cheat day, so you could at least be honest here. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding. It's in the basement on the shelf unused. Okay. Um, However, this is a technology that we see in a lot of environments. So even though people um, somehow do not believe that you can get like uh, incredibly big, big and black in 12 weeks, uh, however, they seem to believe in that stuff. 
Um, there is more stuff. I didn't find anything to highlight here because basically the whole paragraph is like it's complete protection, everything. So I'm, I, if we don't get any, a hand here, then um, I actually don't believe you. Who has a McAfee endpoint protection in, the, in their environment? So, okay, thank you. Four or five hands, that's something. And then coming a bit closer to like the core of this talk, we have products that combat today's advanced persistent threats. I mean, we also have the vendor on here. Um, who has a FireEye product in the environment? One, two, oh, okay. I mean, this was almost as much as McAfee. That would be a, a weird ratio, but still, um, I gotta leave you alone on that. So, um, this is also like the, the main topic of the presentation. What are we gonna look into? Uh, and something called APT protection. There are a lot of terms out there, like advanced or next, next generation malware detection. Uh, but this is the term we're going to use, APT protection. Um, in order to look into that, we of course need to see what protection means. That's an easy one. And I was actually very happy when I looked this one up because the definition that we find here, the state of being kept from harm is like a really nice definition uh, for someone who's also involved in a lot of risk management uh, projects. But of course, I mean, the protection is not important um, to define. However, I somehow needed a smooth transition to be able to speak about uh, the defini definition of APT. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you have heard the term APT. Uh, and I don't like to use this term, especially um, like um, in project contexts. It's actually kind of like a lame at ENW to use that word uh, instead of saying targeted attack or something like that. Uh, however, since it's about APT protection, I'm going to use it. So, a ton of people have talked about APT, what it is. I'm pretty sure all of you have a somewhat of an understanding. Um, also, Rodrigo, I think two years ago, translated this nicely into the Asian Pacific threat um, <laughs> in his keynote, which is totally unrelated to the picture I choose for this slide. Um, however, if we are looking at the term APT, just to be complete here, it stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. There's a definition from 2010, actually a rather formal, a semi-formal formal one by Richard Bateley, which who is now with FireEye, actually, um, as we also learned in the morning. However, he provided this definition what APT is. So, the advanced stands for that the uh, adversary can operate in the full spectrum of computer intrusion. So basically, they do whatever they want. They don't lose, uh, use any particular intrusion technique. They use anything that helps them to uh, fulfill their goals or reach their goals. Persistent means that the adversary is not an opportun opportunistic intruder. So they are not just script kiddies who are scanning your network or looking around a little bit. They actually want to access your data. They are on a mission. And they won't stop if like, the first attempt does not work. Uh, then threat. This is, uh, again, someone being involved in risk management is not a nice uh, definition for me here. However, uh, he defined it that that means the adversary is not a piece of mindless code. And this definition is particularly relevant for us. Um, also, by the way, the term APT, according to Bateley, was uh, coined by the US Air Force and not by Mendy and um, as many also uh, think. So, um, when I have this threat definition in mind, it means that the adversary is not a piece of mindless code. There's a very interesting first deduction. So if we, if we translate all of this here into like a one um, basic sentence, it means APT is human attackers with a certain level of skills um, that are not automated malware. That's that what it comes down to. So, the first interesting uh, observation here is actually that it's an interesting assumption to think you can prevent a threat which is not caused by automated software using automated software. But this might only be my first impression. Uh, however, I was not alone with this impression. I'm just going to leave that here. Um, I think like as a uh, CISO of a very large environment, uh, you can be able to say something like that. Uh, I like this statement, and it was, of course, uh, good to make the point of the talk here. So, um, so this was a first introductory definition of APT and what we're talking about. So what the actual goal of the talk is, is we, are, we want to evaluate whether those behavior-based malware detection solutions, you see we tried to avoid the term, term APT here, um, are suitable to protect your environment from typical threats that we see out there. And in the course of doing so, we of course also want to provide you some in insight on the internals of those uh, behavior-based analysis 
solutions. Uh, because our impression like really is uh, the marketing works. Everyone is buying this to protect themselves from APT. Uh, however, nobody really understands what those uh, things are doing. I mean, it's a bit early, but thank you. <laughs> um, so everybody, everybody is buying those boxes, but nobody understands what's going on inside. So we will look a little bit into those boxes and what they can actually be provide. In doing so, uh, we had a look into several APT scenarios, um, modeled these somehow. We derived attack patterns that were used in those scenarios and uh, some primitives based uh, on those. And then, of course, we evaluated, okay, how do those solutions work uh, against those uh, threat scenarios? Oh, sorry. Working. All right, in doing so, in order to define APT, we try to have a look at the most relevant APT scenarios of the last years. And by doing so, of course, we had some uh, experience from customer context when we analyzed some incidents. Uh, those were like four during the last two years. Then we looked into incident reports that were available from uh, companies uh, that were like exposed to very prominent cases of APT. And of course, we also take into account what other, what other researchers say, what typical attacks look like. So, what we saw in the course of the incidents, like on a very, very basic generic level, is that there was an attacker in the internet, and this attacker compromised uh, some crappy web application in the DMZ. So, uh, SQL injection, uh, some command execution, or whatever, or just a remote memory compromise, whatever you think someone could find there. So basically, they were compromising, like a classical attacker, a server in the DMZ, and then, this is maybe one of the more interesting points, even though this is also not new, they dumped credentials on those servers and used those credentials to spread through the network. Eventually, they all uh, got a hold of a domain administrator account and from that point, basically, it was game over. So that was actually the typical pattern that we saw in four incidents that we analyzed uh, during the last two years. All incidents had like roughly that pattern. So this is uh, the stuff we saw in the last two years. Then we tried to look into incident reports that were published by the companies who had major data breaches in the last three years. So first we started, okay, we want to look at the reports of the last three years, which had more than 10 million breach data records. Um, and we looked into those. This was a list of roughly 20 breaches. And out of those 20 breaches, and I was really surprised by that fact, there were only two technical incident reports available. So basically, actually, there's all like the general news about that. Oh, Target was breached. Oh, another company was breached. Uh, and everybody's playing it down. Oh, no, we won't release technical details yet because we're still investigating. And then after two or three months, of course, nobody's uh, taking care about those incident reports anymore. So that's why actually only for two of those incidents, uh, technical details are available. So we decided, okay, let's look around a little bit further. So we looked at February 2015. There were 39 incidents that we saw and that were somewhat covered by the news or some um, uh, press releases. And out of those, one more technical analysis was available. And then we widened up a little bit. We reduced uh, the scope of the, um, the number of breached records. And we found three more technical analyses that were, avail analysis that were available. Um, we also focused on like the more prominent cases such as LinkedIn, AOL, Snapchat, Hetzner, and all that stuff. So, um, out of those, actually the JP Morgan case, um, two smaller incidents, and many other much smaller incidents, actually also followed the attack scheme that we saw above. They compromised a server in the DMC and then spread through the network. So basically, still compromising a crappy web app that you have running somewhere is still a relevant application, a relevant uh, attack vector. And then there were some more that were um, victims of spare phishing. So um, this is also what Mandiant described in the infamous APT1 report. Uh, report and what Ange Albertini uh, described on 44Con, where he described some typical uh, attack vectors. For example, of course, you, you get an email, and in that email is either a link to, or an attached PDF, or an office document, or even uh, directly an executable file. So this is also the typical stuff that others see out there. 
So basically, we have a second scenario where the attacker sends an email to the victim in the network, dumps credentials, and from them on. It's basically the same idea. I mean, this is nothing new I'm telling you here. The interesting part is that most of the stuff that we are still seeing falls into those two categories. So when looking into those categories and breaking those down a little bit, um, we come up with the following attack phases. Of course, first you have to infect um, the victim or the victim network in a first step. You can do that either by uh, attacking a user, so sending out an email or doing a water holding attack, or you can compromise a server in the DMZ. So that's the two options that we're actually seeing out there, and it comes down to that. Then the next step is to persist. This one is very closely related to the first step of infection. So, For example, if you receive a malicious PDF, uh, there's not a whole payload in there. Typically, there's like a, a dropper or a loader in there that downloads a binary and persists that um, to the victim's system. So this is the second stage. Then the third stage is to loot the system, uh, access everything you can get, and extract the interesting data. So basically bring it out of the company network. And then the last step, once you did all of this, you want to spread through the network. This is the last step, um, like dumping credentials and using those to infect further PCs, uh, uh, systems. So when we want to detect those attack steps, which are basically part of all the described APT scenarios, or attack scenarios, uh, that we derived from the steps before. There are a lot of vendors out there um, that promise you, okay, this APT stuff that we're having here, we can detect that. There are a lot of vendors out there. Uh, these are just some of them, at least uh, from my perspective um, or perception, the most prominent ones. Um, we did not look at all of those. They also have some different um, focus uh, uh, some of them, but we had experience with Fire Iron C Scaler in actually quite some customer projects. I mean, uh, let's say during the last um, eight to 16 months, a lot of customers were asking us, okay, there's two pro uh, products. They are like promising us um, that we can have a, a realistic APT protection that protects us from exactly the stuff that we are still failing uh, to defend against, like spear phishing and all that stuff that compromises our network. So what do you think about those? So in the course of several customer requests and project, um, projects, we actually gathered quite some experience with those. So um, as I said, uh, those products are available in many customer environments. Um, we only have experience with those two. So whatever I'm saying does only apply to FireEye and Zscaler. And the typical deployment that we see is uh, that you have like a, a proxy deployed or that you filter the mail traffic of the environment. Uh, as for Cscaler, um, the web uh, analysis, I think it's still the only product they are offering. So they only uh, offer to inspect your web traffic. So they're offering you a proxy service, proxy as a service in the cloud, um, and they inspect your web traffic. Um, as for FireEye, they have a lot more products. They also have like a network, um, intrusion detection for your internal network and stuff like that. But um, we mainly looked at those. So um, when we look at those deployment scenarios that web traffic and email traffic is inspected, we actually need to ask us, okay, well, this stuff here, that can probably be detected, but the server-based compromises, they probably would be difficult to detect, I mean, based on the architecture that we see. If the proxy traffic is inspected or the mail traffic is inspected, that probably doesn't help you if someone is compromising your web application, at least uh, for the typical deployments that we see. If we're talking about user and file-based attacks, of course, I mean, that's what they are made for. Someone is downloading a file from the internet, um, maybe some Java applet, Office document, PDF document. Uh, they are supposed to analyze that and tell you whether it's malicious or benign. So, Again, of course, I will come back to that later. There are like lot more, lots of more interesting file formats, such as Wireshark files or PCAP files or Photoshop files, uh, certain media files, uh, like uh, VLC had a like, huge history of vulnerabilities. So there are other interesting file formats that one can look at, especially when you have like the targeted focus in mind. Um, even IDA might be an interesting target to exploit when you're looking at the, uh, at the correct victim. So. Um, if we're looking at the user file-based infection, 
what are the attack primitives that we need to look for if we are an APT protection solution. So that's basically what we broke it down to. Uh, if a file is opened, we want to see whether uh, there's a memory compromise happening, um, whether there is ASLR bypassing in place, so basically like uh, ROP chains or like stack pivoting, um, whether there are some interesting ways to load an external library. Well, maybe a lot of like malware samples out there uh, don't load libraries the traditional way, whether there's heap spaying in place, and like the first um, transition to the persistence phase is to download further files. So these are basically the attack primitives in the infection phase that an APT protection solution would need to look out for. Then during the persistence phase, what is happening there? For example, a binary or executable is downloaded and saved somewhere on the hard drive. Um, those binaries might be packed, there might be a debugger detection, there might obfuscation um, be available. Then maybe additional users are created, even though that it's quite noisy. However, I would not want to have additional users on my systems. There might be open network ports for a bind shell. There might be something written to auto run. There might be uh, special bypassing mechanisms for hooking. And of course, there are stalling mechanisms in modern malware, which actually target exactly those APT protection solutions. For example, I mean, this, I will cover that later, how they actually work, um, which is also not too surprised. I mean, they are behavior-based malware analysis solutions. So if you look at a malware binary for five minutes and nothing happens, um, that's basically a good sign, right? But if that malware waits for five minutes or basically waits for a certain event, like a left click of your mouse, um, such an analysis solution would have a hard time actually observing the behavior. So however, if that persistence thing worked, we would need to look out for all different um, file access that could happen. So for example, if Windows credentials are dumped, which was really like one of the main compromise steps that we saw uh, in all the incidents, whether like mail passwords are accessed, the browser password history, there might be some instant messaging in place and uh, maybe looking more at the private sector, some banking information that might be accessed by some online banking tools. And of course, uh, what we actually also saw, there might be some network sniffing in place or some traffic redirection, like adding additional entries to the host's file or something like that. So this is all malicious activity that such an APT protection could observe uh, from our perspective. Then the next step is to exfiltrate data. Um, there is like a variety of ways available how you can do that. Um, based on our deployment scenario that we had, that we looked at the proxy-based solution, it was of course uh, not possible to evaluate the detection rate for uh, other exfiltration metho methods, but however, like HTTP-based exfiltration is still something that one might want to look at. And that definitely needs to be detected by um, a proxy-based APT solution. So the last phase, spreading through the, net through the network, what is happening here? Um, basically, you want to compromise more hosts through the network. You can do that either, either using the same or an additional infection technique, or you use your dumped Windows credential, and that's what we unfortunately saw most of the time in the past, and what also happened uh, according to some incident reports. So. Um, we will not cover this in this presentation since, of course, a um, uh, proxy-based solution has only like limited insight in what's happening inside of your network. So we will not cover this in this presentation. So let's look a little bit in the different detection methods that we have. So basically, um, we had the, the, reg uh, the, the regular C-scalar services that we have experience with, including the behavior-based analysis. And we had a FireEye appliance that we performed most of our tests at in order to like actually verify those and of course it was a like sufficiently recent version of like all the data that it has. So those were deployed in a lab environment something like that. Of course we have a FireEye deployed in proxy mode in our own network and for the tests of the Cscaler solution uh, we used a uh, Cscaler proxy as a service solution that was hosted somewhere by Cscaler. In order to evaluate those, um, we need to know how those uh, solutions detect malicious files. Basically what they do, um, they execute the binary in a sandboxed environment and 
try to observe what uh, the binary is doing or the, whatever the file, the, the malicious file is doing. This can be done either like in the operating system of the sandbox. Uh, typical methods here are API hooking, whether it's like uh, import table based or inline based or um, whatever. Uh, you can deploy registry filter drivers or there are a lot of different ways to implement like a malware analysis sandbox uh, in the operating system. Second way would be to emulate either the binary or also the, like the whole operating system um, that it is uh, executed in, or this is like, like one of the more recent ways, it's virtual machine introspection. So basically you, you leverage the hypervisor uh, in order to gain insight uh, the operating system and what's going on in there. Uh, there are like two main approaches available from our perspective. Uh, this is either the, the VMX strapping or the EPT-based approach. I won't go into detail um, into those detection methods because for like the evalu evaluation that we did, it's not too important here. We did not want to evaluate, okay, does this method provide better results when monitoring the well malware than this method? We actually wanted to provide some real world um, feedback. Okay, what can those solutions deliver and what uh, can they not deliver? So um, when we uh, executed the binary in the sandbox, we get something called uh, an execution trace, or what I call an execution trace. So it's basically a list of all the system activity that what was observed by the, uh, from the malware. So for example, system calls, uh, registry access, network activity, uh, files that were created, which is basically all covered by system calls or API calls. Uh, but basically you get a pretty good idea what the malware was doing. Um, you also like get a PCAP file that you can download and look into, so what the malware was transferring over the network. Um, and all that stuff. So you basically look at the malware uh, like you did it in the traditional dynamic analysis mode. You were looking uh, with API monitors, with Wireshark, with registry monitors, so the system internal tool suite, um, at the malware and uh, try to determine what the malware is doing. So that's what uh, those solutions are doing in an automated way. Um, as I already said, our evaluation scope was not on the quality of detection methods, whether emulation or hooking <clears throat> is better. Uh, this is not what we, what we wanted to look at. We also did not like run a mass testing of samples. Like, um, okay, we downloaded those like five million uh, malware samples and the one solution detected like 85% and the other one detected 83%. So that's also not the focus. We also did not focus on performance here. We were interested in providing you feedback um, how those solutions actually work. So they detect stuff the malware is doing, but then you get like a, a trace of system calls and network activity, but what does, does that actually mean? I mean, there is still some interpretation necessary. Um, there's not like one single action that is performed on a system and you can say, okay, this binary is clearly malicious because it created the file uh, malicious.exe. That's just not possible. So all of those solutions somehow had to derive uh, heuristics what is a typical malware file doing and how are we detecting this in the execution trace? So for example, if we have this registry access and this network activity and uh, we detected um, like heap spraying in the binary, then it's malicious. So we need to understand how those solutions are putting the pieces together and how they are um, deciding what's malicious and what's not malicious. So um, we created like a handful of samples which was basically actually enough to give us a pretty good insight um, on what the different solutions were doing. So, uh, first of all, we had like three PDF documents that were used in, okay, I will give you a second to take pictures here. Um, there were three PDF documents that were actually used in uh, APT attacks. Um, those were like rather old, um, but we actually used this as uh, some kind of a baseline. So basically they used heap spraying, they had uh, rub chains in them, and they tried to download a binary from the internet that they then were about to execute on the system. So the next one was from 2014. It was actually a buffer overflow in Wireshark, which could be triggered by opening a certain uh, PCAP file, um, which was a buffer overflow and was opening a bind shell. This one was straight from Metasploit. This is also one of the PDF documents, uh, no, I was, I was wrong here, that's the PCAP file, 
uh, but it's still straight from Metasploit. Another Metasploit uh, thing was a um, Microsoft Office exploit in an RTF document. Uh, again, a bind shell. Then we had one of the latest uh, exploits of the Flash Player that we tested. Um, just since it's not like a traditional file-based thing that you download and execute then, but uh, it's somehow automatically executed in the browser. So it was also a meta Metasploit module uh, resulting in a reverse shell. Um, then again, another Metasploit module, and this is the interesting one here, uh, one of the more recent uh, attacks against the Acrobat reader from 2013, also opening a bind shell, or in another, in a different version, we also like uh, just opened a, a calc. Then we had a Photoshop file-based overflow, also opening um, the calculator uh, from 2012. So those were like rather typical examples, and since the solutions are actually bes uh, observing the behavior, uh, it is difficult to develop uh, something custom here. I mean, we would need like a zero day against uh, the most recent uh, Acrobat reader version in order to actually see whether they are able to de detect zero day attacks. Um, however, we will see uh, how this worked out so far. Um, then when it comes more to the persistence step uh, in, the, in the attack process, we created some binaries that created a user on the local system, just a regular API call um, to create a user on the system. Then we also tried to uh, transfer uh, several um, meter payloads, also like straight from Metasploit, just to see uh, how the solutions would react to that. Then of course we had some more custom code um, that from our perspective was suited to evaluate uh, how those solutions are working. So, for example, we had a, a custom Mimikatz clone, which was used to dump Windows credentials. Um, then we had a very simple uh, utility that was just adding a binary to the, to the Windows auto run. Then we had a further version that was downloading a Python script and writing that one to auto run. Then we had a file that was reading the, the backup SAM file and posting it to an HTTP server. Then we actually had a, a PowerShell script that was a keylogger and also posted the lock keys to a central server. Um, then we had a custom reverse shell, not from Metasploit this time, um, because we also wanted to see how they were doing with that. Then, um, this is not really fitting in here very well, since it's a, like basically that's the capability to detect command and control traffic. Uh, because both like Cscaler and FireEye are also saying, okay, we also detect various kinds of command and control traffic. So we decided, okay, we can at least give that a very basic try. Uh, if they claim so, we can evaluate that. So here's the tricky part in the ev evaluation of this. If you have the typical services, for, uh, at least for the uh, FireEye box, they offer a dedicated malware analysis box where you can upload samples and they get analyzed. So you get a basically a malware analysis report uh, about the binary that you just uploaded. However, if you have the typical box in your environment um, that is running in proxy mode or that is um, uh, uh, analyzing the attachments that come in, come in via email, um, it's really difficult because FireEye only, detect, uh, only tells you what it's detected. So if something is not showing up as malicious, it is like really difficult to see, okay, was the FireEye working properly? Was it just not detected? Or what is the particular reason that we don't have an alert here in the web interface now? So, um, basically we had to do this in a black box assessment since we did not have access to like the source code or some internal documentation. So we tried to uh, put together like a solid uh, statement about the cap capabilities of those solutions um, without um, be just making speculations and not having reliable uh, results. So for the FireEye, what we did, as you can see here, um, the work order is the relevant term. So work order means a binary that is about to be processed in a sandbox. So if you download a file and 10 seconds after that, you see that there's a work order running, you know, okay, this file was just passed to analysis. We of course also isolated that, that we have a dedicated notebook that we just used to, um, to download files and not do anything else. Uh, it was also Linux based, uh, so there was no background noise like you would have on a Mac or something like that. Um, so basically that's the approach that we used in order to analyze that. 
When it comes to Cscaler, it's actually really nice because it tells you what it sends to analysis and what it doesn't even look at all. So here we had some more insights in, in, in what was detected or not. But this also only holds true uh, for files. If there would be like an embedded flash file, it's already more difficult or for command and control traffic. It also doesn't tell you, um, of course, we did, we did not detect that or not classify it as malicious because it's somewhat difficult to do. So when looking at that, both solutions offer like a very, very distinct uh, process of analysis. So first of all, uh, they intercept the file in the web traffic and then they have a built-in AV solution, so just traditional signature-based antivirus. Um, if that file is malicious, of course, it's uh, classified as malicious. If not, we go on to check the file type. So do we have a, a, known, a file type that we can analyze? So is this an executable file? Is this a PDF document? Is this anything that we support for analysis? If not, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's benign, but from the attacker perspective, that's where you want to go. You don't want the sandbox to analyze that because that means, okay, nothing can be detected here. If it's a file type that we can analyze, we pass it over to the behavior-based analysis. It was somewhat difficult to find the icon for that, so that's a hamster in the, in the little wheel, um, just to make this more clear. Uh, and then the behavior-based analys analysis, of course, tells you, okay, that's a malicious file or that's not a malicious file. So that's the basic options that we have. It can be detected by, anti by the antivirus solution or it can be detected by the behavior-based analysis. And of course, if we can determine that, it's also interesting to see whether it was handed to the behavior-based analysis at all. So we see whether it was analyzed. So uh, let's have a look at the results so far. So I'm going to make those like a little bit faster. Those are like actual APT samples from two to three years ago. So of course, all of those were detected. Uh, funnily enough, they were all handed to the behavior-based uh, analysis solution, but they detected those uh, as malicious. So, when it comes to PGAP file, we have the first interesting result. Not analyzed at all. So they don't support the analysis of PCAP files. Um, this is, I mean, not too surprising. None of the vendors is claiming that, that they analyze uh, PCAP files. But from our perspective, if you have uh, an attacker that is putting some effort into getting into your network and you want to target network administrators, from my perspective, it would not be such a crazy idea to uh, create a spoofed mail that has a PCAP file attached, like, oh, I was running into some problems with the network. Here's a network dump. Could you have a look at that? Um, I would think that's a valid attack vector, and it's not analyzed by those solutions at all. Then, what do we have here? We have an RTF file. So just a plain file that is uh, opened by some kind of editor. Um, FireEye detected this in the behavior-based way. Oh, by the way, I was, I was wrong. Um, that was, of course, all like uh, the anti antivirus engine that detected that, sorry. Um, but um, in this case, the RTF file was not analyzed. Um, but however, uh, FireEye detected this via the behavior-based solution. So. Uh, let's also think about that for a second. We have like a Metasploit module from 2014 and FireEye needs the behavior-based analysis engine in order to detect that. That's also kind of an interesting statement. I mean, I needed to the, disable the Windows security essentials when downloading those. Uh, I think that's a pretty strong statement here. So, um, another interesting thing. Flash player file, 2014 was not analyzed by FireEye. It was detected by the antivirus engine of Cscaler. Next one, Metasploit PDF, 2013. Both of those solutions had to give it to the behavior, behavioral analysis solution, but then they also detected it, both like in an orange state though. Um, so they did not like give a, like a completely red exclamation mark that this is totally malicious, but uh, they detected it. Then we have the Photoshop file. They also did not analyze that. Photoshop um, might be like a, a personal thing. I would think it's less likely that Photoshop files are used than PCAP files, but again, that might be a personal thing. Uh, there are probably some users in your network that use Photoshop. So when we're looking at all the persistence mechanisms, 
Now here is the interesting part. So one of your users downloads an executable from the internet that is trying to create a local user account. Would you like that in your network? Okay, yes, no questions to an audience is always bad. Uh, who would like that in his uh, network? Okay, so none of you. This, this time I formulated it the right way. You want it the other way around? Who would not like that in the network? Server user. And your exchange uh, server should download that from the internet? Where else do that guy to get patches from? <laughs> That's, uh, okay, I agree. Um, that's a valid point. Um, however, you must still argue, okay, um, this like one case, um, does it apply to all of your office users? Um, but it's, it's the, this one's trusted, this one's not. What's the difference to so the binary analysis? This is actually very, uh, what it boils down to. This is like probably in 95% of the cases, something that you don't want, but how is the solution, how is it supposed to tell that? Um, Oh, this was actually like part of the conclusion that I want to make. Um, of course, it's like imp impossible to tell when is this legitimate and when is it not. Um, I would also be surprised to, or interested to see statistics, how often is someone downloading a binary from the internet that is adding a user. Um, uh, however, still I think that's not a good thing to do and actually we used this very binary in several penetration tests. Uh, in order to get access to a system. So um, at least we can say this is like a valid attack vector. If it's written by ULA, I wouldn't want it. Sorry, come again? If it was written by ULA, I wouldn't want it. Okay. <laughs> so what do we have? Uh, we have several Metasploit samples, and this is where I'm actually a bit cautious here. Several Metasploits, so the, the, the meter breeder stuff, um, was not analyzed or not detected by the FireEye. I would be really surprised if that were true. So um, this might be something um, we did not completely understand the fire isolations or something like that. Um, however, we heard from a customer context that they experienced that one time and the response from FireEye was, oh, that was accidentally whitelisted internally. Um, However, I uh, put this like in a transparent mode. I don't want to use this as a like hard statement that Fire is not able to detect media preta. I would be too surprised and shocked by that. Um, however, Cscaler detected that with the antivirus uh, engine. So, what do we have? Something that dumps credentials. Interesting thing, detected by the behavior-based analysis solution. So this stuff is dumping uh, Windows credentials. Do you have any idea why this uh, stuff was detected by the behavior or any guess? I mean, of course, it's obvious because it dumps Windows credentials. However, this binary requires a command line parameter. So it was detected because it was showing suspic suspicious activity by not doing anything. So that's why it was detected here. Um, we, will, we will come back to that later. So um, when it comes to the persistence mechanism, writing stuff to auto run, um, Cscaler actually does too, writing something to auto run and downloading something and writing it to auto run, detected it using the antivirus solution, which was like really interesting. Um, but then again, FireEye gave that into the um, uh, analysis, behavior-based analysis solution and said, okay, that's not malicious. And again, same thing applies. There are probably like actually also a lot of end user problem, uh, uh, um, programs out there. Um, that are using this functionality. So that's difficult to do. But when we come to the next one, a binary that is dumping the backup SAM file and posting it via HTTP um, to the internet. That was both sent into the behavior-based analysis solution, but nah, that's not malicious. Here it is really difficult to, to tell why. However, this is like also another part of the conclusion. And this will be on one of the next slides. Those solutions are really good um, in detecting like the complete attack path. But once you start using only uh, single attack primitives, um, you have a very good um, chance to get through. So oh, this is actually wrong. Um, There's a slight mistake, sorry for that. None of the solutions uh, actually uh, looks at PowerShell files. So PowerShell files are just not analyzed. Um, 
I mean, um, there are certain limitations on Windows systems in order to uh, um, execute PowerShell scripts from untrusted sources. Uh, but uh, however, if you're targeting administrators who are probably working a lot uh, with PowerShell scripts, um, it might be also an interesting attack path to look into, especially if you're like a properly uh, engineered social, uh, social engineering email. <laughs> and what this binary is doing was logging your keystrokes and posting it to a server. Um, but basically, it wasn't analyzed. Um, and I think, um, did anyone attend the workshop PowerShell for Hackers? I'm pretty sure you saw nasty stuff that you can do with PowerShell. Um, basically, you can use the whole Windows API from there, so uh, we're good to go to do anything. All right, the meterpreter reverse HTTP traffic, which was the only thing that we tested for command and control traffic. Because you said, okay, command and control traffic, what is that? basically transferring data. So we thought, okay, we do something well known. It was detected by FireEye, but unfortunately not by Cscaler. Um, also something that surprised us, but um, how would you want to detect something that comes from Metasploit? Then our custom uh, reverse shell. Both had to send this into behavior-based analysis, which is a good sign for our tools, to be honest. And FireEye detected this to be malicious. Um, Cscaler, however, said, nope, that's not malicious. So, basically, we would need like one huge slide where we see all the results next to each other. Um, but some observations that I also want to make here. There are certain attack primitives out there that can definitely be used by an attacker, creating a user on a local system, <coughs> posting certain data to some server in the internet. But they just do not resemble the complete attack path. File is downloaded. Credentials are dumped, or binary is uh, loaded through the exploit, then written to disk, then something ex is accessed and then exfiltrated. So when it comes to this complete attack path, those solutions would probably detect that stuff if you give it into the sandbox. Then they would probably detect this whole complete attack path. But when you use different attack primitives um, in order to stay under the radar, uh, there's a very good chance that it won't be detected by those solutions. So this is like one first conclusion here. However, um, even though we want to like present that in a, in a neutral way, um, and like just tell you, okay, what are those solutions capable to do and what not, it would not be an actual troopers talk um, if we would not have a generic bypass possibility for that stuff. So if you remember this PDF document, that was the, document, the PDF document generated with Metasploit that was detected by both solutions. Um, basically, it was behavior-based by FireEye, it was like orange, and Cscaler said, okay, that's 7% suspicious. Which is okay. If we're coming back to like the complete attack path, this PDF document, an exploit, um, was executed. Okay, we don't see that here, but both of them detected heap spraying. And then uh, something is happening on the system. In this case, a reverse shell pops up. It was not the complete attack path from the product's perspective. So the exploit was uh, successful, something was happening, but the something that was happening was not the typical loader that would like get the actual payload in order to make that thing persistent. So it was just opening a reverse shell. So no file was downloaded, no file was written to auto run, something like that. So that's the stuff that you would need in order to, come, uh, to become like a red uh, alert or 100% alert. So. Uh, I took this PDF document because it's still working in like um, Acrobat reader versions that are like uh, sufficiently um, recent, sufficient enough to see that in some corporate environments. And what we did is basically create a small exe file that just said go on, an executable concatenated this file with the PDF document, which generates another PDF document. So Windows will open this as a PDF because it's still opening stuff purely based on the file extension. However, what both solutions are doing, they see, oh, wait, we'll look at the header and that's a valid PE file. So we hand that over to the behavior analysis and we will analyze that as an executable. And as we can see, that's a completely benign file because it's not executed as a PDF document. So you can see it in the screenshots. 
Uh, of course, all those uh, solutions provide screenshots, so you can see that an exe file, an executable, was copied uh, to the sandbox and then executed. And it's the same result on FireEye. So that is like basically one generic bypass uh, mechanism for those sol solutions. And it's basically also the only thing we really looked at because we were more interested in providing you some insight in what those solutions can do and what they can't do. So, um, some conclusions. Um, what was detected? I already talked a little bit about that. The solutions were pretty good at like detecting the complete attack path, as I called it. Exploit is happening, something is downloaded, and something is written to an auto-run mechanism. Uh, I think the important uh, step, at least from the estimations that we got here, is that there needs to be an exploit, and then a binary needs to be downloaded, and the binary needs to be executed. That's actually what those solutions are like really specialized in detecting in. Um, that's the complete attack path. Exfiltration, we saw that metasploit, uh, meta metapreter traffic was detected. Um, so that might be detectable. Traditional malware behavior is also detected, like writing to auto run. Some of the uh, Cscaler at least thought uh, it was a good idea to not let applications write stuff to, uh, to auto run. And what we also need to keep in mind, have the deployment scenario in mind. 50% of the APT scenarios that we looked at were not based on this, this user-based infection at all. So if you have the stuff deployed in a, in, a, in a proxy way or inspecting your email traffic, you will not catch 50% of the stuff that's going on, like uh, compromising some crappy web application um, and then hopping through your network from there. I'm not saying here you should buy web application firewalls, okay? Just to make sure. So. Those things are not, also not really context aware. As we said, like, um, it might be a perfectly valid tool that is creating an additional user account. But when a normal, regular user is downloading this binary from the internet, I don't think it's a good idea that this binary should create a user account on your system. So there's like no context awareness. Um, so uh, somewhat concluding, they can complement your traditional antivirus solutions, but what a surprise, it's not a silver bullet. I don't think any one of you expected that, but we hope we can provide you some results if you have to argue about that internally. But from our perspective, the most relevant point, and this is where I can come back to my exercising story from the beginning, uh, once you look behind all the marketing slides and what the different solutions can do for you, it comes down to this. Uh, pick some exercises that you have good uh, technique with and that you have like uh, operational experience with, and just progress those. Do some small complement stuff on the side and it works. So, um, also quoting like Alex, Alex Damos from his keynote, build your solutions, don't buy them. If you buy them, make sure that you also implement the supporting processes. Like um, all those nice solutions, um, Target had one in the infamous breach. Um, all those solutions do not help if nobody's looking at the alerts and nobody is working with the results. This is also like some, some universal truth uh, that we always share at ENW. And going well with this, um, you should definitely evaluate the benefit of like a 100K prescription per year for like this advanced threat intelligence feed that uh, does not think that posting the SAM file to a server in the internet is malicious uh, versus an additional person that is just reading your log files or something like that. So this was basically my conclusion on those APT protection solutions. Um, any questions for that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. From your experience in the field, so to say, have you ever seen a deployment of one of those boxes where they would have been able to see the whole attack chain unfolding? Because I don't know, that's a, my experience, usually that's not the case. I mean, um, I've never seen such a deployment. Basically, I mean, FireEye, based on their product portfolio, they offer solutions to do that. They can inspect web traffic, email traffic, and then they, like the network intrusion detection system, who is particularly moni monitoring like SMB access. Then it's managed, and then there's personnel from behind it looking into the so that's no longer a box. Okay, that's, uh, that's an additional problem. I agree on that. Um, 
A big problem is also those solutions might be able to provide you some benefit now that you know what they are doing. The big problem is also like the marketing stuff behind that, that they promise like complete APT and zero day detection. And that promise just can't hold true. I mean, this is not a surprise for you, but now you have some data to back that. Yes? No, we did not. We actually have some, we have some ideas for that, but we did not do that yet since our focus was not on bypassing, but on understanding how that stuff works. Did you do any testing on Josen bots? No, we did not. We have mainly had like those like big commercial players in mind. And since it was customer project based, we had experience with Fire and Cscaler, and it's like difficult to, to find all the different deployments. Yeah. Um, the PCAP exploit file interests mm -hmm. It was like straight from Metasploit. So, well, the, yeah, the PCAP file, is it a valid PCAP file that you could find it in any network stream? Or was it for Metasploit crafted for that purpose to do the memory act right? Um, that is actually a good question. I would need to look into more details here. So you mean whether you can send the network packet and Wireshark sniffs that and then crashes? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm asking for a reason because I'm seeing weird stuff sometimes on my uh, PCAP server. OK. Um, I'm not sure what this exploit was actually doing, but there are like both versions out there. Yeah. Do you have any customers using that set scale? Yes. And they are fine with the service, with the stability especially? Because we had it with oh. our company, and especially for HTTPS, we had sometimes some so okay, I'm, I'm not aware of that. We are not using that, uh, that service on our own, and uh, I haven't heard that from customers. Um, if that person agrees, I can introduce you to someone to uh, exchange with, um, but we haven't heard something like that. Okay. Thanks again, Matthias.